I grew up in a small plantation town on the island of Kauai. And growing up Hawaiian then, it wasn't cool. I grew up being ashamed I was Hawaiian. There were no role models for Hawaiians. If you were Hawaiian in my town, then you would be as this epitome of Hawaiian family. You would have dogs in your house. You wouldn't have curtains on your window. You would be very poor. You would talk this strange language. And you know, being Hawaiian in that town wasn't cool then. I'm 31 now. And I think a lot of Hawaiians my age, maybe a little older, 40, can relate to this process of growing up being Haw ashamed you're Hawaiian. And then around the 60s, 70s, with this Hawaiian activist, land struggles, very political. Being Hawaiian, this renaissance of Hawaiian stuff emerged. When you realize that, hey, something's going on here. The anger that's been oppressed those generations burst, talk about paley erupting. It's a bit of vengeance. The Hawaiian voice started emerging. A beep beep, manao, malama, aloha aina, kaho'olawe. Hmm? And so Hawaiians who were oppressed all those years started gritting their teeth and taking ancient hula lessons and learning to speak their language. I'm so glad I have nine nieces and nephews that they won't have to go through the anger and the bitterness and the wrenching apart that we Hawaiians had to go through. We lost what it meant to be Hawaiian, and then we found it. And then we started to all the mud and we chose what aspects of being Hawaiian we wanted to keep. And now my nieces and nephews are, they can choose. There's none of that kaumaha or dark energy about being Hawaiian. And they can, my nephew Eli, he's Hawaiian, French, Scots, Chinese, English. He can take the best of all of those cultures and full on, strong, the golden people. <laughs> when I'm walking on the King's Trail, especially under the hot sun, my whole body tends to focus in into myself, the pains of my feet, the, uh, the aching of my shoulders, the hot sun, and everything begins to work what I call mana. My mind also began to think, uh, nothing around, just me alone walking on the trail. As you look down, you see what man did, the type of work. Man built this trail, this road. Perhaps it was part of my ancestors or my family. And so I look at it as mana, not only spiritual mana from the Creator or from the land, but human mana that once uh, helped to build this trail. And so, it depending on the individual, no matter where you come from the world, uh, it's the same thing. We should learn ourselves, how we ourselves react to any place we go, which should be sacred and treat it with dignity and respect. Then at that level, you get to learn more of what's around you, below you or above you. I look at myself and identify myself as a Hawaiian more so within these past three years. Uh, I feel good. I guess it's my color. I guess it's my looks. I guess it's uh, the way I talk or the way people look at me and identify me and say, are you Hawaiian? And I say, yes, I am. I feel good about it, more so than in the past 20 years ago or during my childhood. And when they look at me, they, they see the ocean in me, they see the stone in me, they see the clouds in me, they see the, the Hawaiian in me. I think the rest of the state or people who come to Hawaii need to know that we as Hawaiians shouldn't be looked upon as a tourist attraction. 
I think that's a big boo-boo there. I think we shouldn't, as Hawaiians, be looked upon as a separate foreigner. I think we should be looked at as just people who came from this land and have all rights to stay on this land and to remain on this land and to know us that we plan to continue to live on this land for the next thousand years. Every day it's a spiritual understanding. When I go hunting or when I go beach, I identify immediately with the gods and their creations. Our gods are nature gods. You can see them, you can touch them, you can feel them, and it has a home and it lives with us. I am very clear about my identity to Hawaii and who I am. I, I try to practice my religion. I try to practice being Hawaiian as well as try to get by in, in this system. I believe that I carry the spirits of my ancestors. It's not something that sets aside like Casper the ghost, you know, or a spirit that's all by itself. I believe it's passed in genealogy and to children and to stuff. Because the spirit I speak and how I believe is of my ancestor. And it's not of high school, of college, or of military, or of that. It's of them. So the spirit that you speak and live and feel when you are around ocean, mountain, or wherever, and when you talk and support or defend it, I speak with that uhani, that spirit of them. It lives in my bones and it will in my children. And the next, it doesn't die, it doesn't. We've learned in our schools and through books and through our experience with our families that we live around that Christianity has come and, and you have to take that base first of the Western Christianity, then you put Hawaiian on top of that. So it's really fragmented Hawaiian on top of a Christian foundation and that's the hard part. This is to me your foundation. As a real Hawaiian, it's your religion. Why should we in Hawaii have the highest juvenile problem and social problem of all races? And it's to me really simple. It's a concept that doesn't fit us. And I know we're forced to try and the stereotypes are trying. They get farther and farther away thinking that they're gaining and gaining, but they're losing more identity. So you got bucks, but who are you? Who are you? And I don't believe that the system can ever say, you Hawaiians have to give up your values for progress. You give up your heiau for a hotel and a job. You give up your land for rockets. You give up, give up your beliefs for en energy. No, that's bunk. We don't have to do nothing. We can just be Hawaiians and win with that and be proud just with that. And then I love to meander on the Aina. I have a lot of love for land, air, ocean, water, and also fire. We know fire as Pele. And all of this is my roots, handed down generation to generation, right on down to me. I can't help these feelings that come out in, inside of me. It's there. I guess you could call it, uh, I believe it's called DNA, handed down generation to generation. I call it mana. That is an identification of that, mana. So you could say I come to Heiau's also to gather this mana, to learn and to gain knowledge so that it's not really all guesswork or something that I just got from gossip or out of a book. I come to investigate head on, to observe, to eyewitness all of this. And I love it. It gives me a chance to be out in my church. 
the for real. You can see the wind blowing in my hair, blowing my clothes. Can't beat that. I'm at home here. I'm on the land of my ancestor. My very roots is connected to this land, to this ocean. I can't help but love Hawaii. It's such a beautiful place. Everything, Mother Nature is very con good, conducive to good living, to good survival, if you take care of all of these things. In this valley of Kākālua, uh, Kupuna once told me that from mountain to ocean, you could not see any trees, but just taro patches. And to this present day, there are just six families raising taro in this region. Being Hawaiian to me is uh, the love that you have for what you're doing on this aina. It's a way of life. Culture is something you live daily. Sometimes it's so nice to go back to the old way. The appreciation that they had on life uh, meant so much. I think uh, nowadays a uh, sense of values have changed and um, the appreciation for the simple things are gone. We look at things in terms of materialistic values, not in terms of nature, the beauty, uh, the wind, the ocean, you know, the water, uh, how you make things grow nice. Uh, the simple things are important, I think, now, for me. I bought this land and I could see possibilities in, in planting different things on this land and, and I cleared it and planted taro on it and bananas and tea leaf and then uh, built a home on it. Before I began uh, building the house, I uh, brought my material up here and um, carried it by hand from the main road to my property timbers, uh, plywood, uh, roofing material. And everything that's needed to build a house had to be carried up. And I would say it's about a mile on a Kuleana trail. You know, I don't want to be known as an extremist. I think that uh, there's a happy medium to this kind of life and life in the city. Um, naturally, I have to work for a living. So, you know, uh, I live out here and I work in the city and I appreciate the city. I'm, I'm not against development. I, I, I think there's a happy medium to everything. And if you can weigh the two and enjoy the two, uh, life is so much more pleasant. Nowadays, when we talk about Hawaiians, we're talking about uh, uh, people who are like me, a quarter Hawaiian with 75% uh, Caucasian or whatever. But I think what we're talking about is setting up programs with the county, the state, even the federal government, if need be, uh, to uh, preserve valleys like this. I think uh, every Hawaiian can do the same thing I did. And I think that's what I tried to accomplish here, to show people that if I can do it, so can they. And I think that's my dream, to see more uh, Hawaiian people move back to their land and do things with their land. In Kona, a Midwest businessman caught a marlin and hung it upside down on a wharf. At Haleiwa, I caught a kumu and I ate it. Off Pokaibe, an Australian competitor caught a tuna and hung it upside down on a wharf. At Kauai Loa, I caught an avail veil and I ate it. Near Makapu'u, a Jaws adventurer caught a shark and hung it upside down on a wharf. At Pupukea, I caught in a hole hole and I ate it. In the Honolulu Press and the tournament box score, 
Eagles reap the ocean of trophies. On the north shore of Oahu, I harvest a gift of life. I think um, my decision to leave Hawaii three, about three and a half years ago and go to Alaska with my whole family was um, my way of learning what happened to other Native people and their relationship with the federal government. And I spent the first year at the University of Anchorage and then two years living in an Eskimo community. When you ask the Eskimo why they were recognized by the United States as being indigenous Native people, they tell you that when the United States bought Alaska from Russia, it did not include the people. It included the trading rights that Russia had with the other um, powers in the world. And it included parts of the land, but it did not include the native sovereignty. So when they came in to drill oil, they joined together and said, this is our land. And before they even put the first drill down, they had to acknowledge native sovereignty. And they did that, and they call it the Alaska Native Claims Act. By associating myself with other native people in Alaska especially, um, that made me stronger. I saw what they were able to accomplish. I now have a different viewpoint on what's important to me as a Hawaiian and how I'm going to attain that now that I'm home. I know that there is a special place um, special areas that have been set aside by the federal government and given in trust for the state of Hawaii to administer that we must get control of. And I don't mean by begging at the legislature or uh, expecting OHA or other agencies to fight for us. We have to educate ourselves to know where these lands are by meets and bounds um, and what we're getting out of them. I'm only one person, but I think if we started in each community and such as Hanalei, where we are today. Project Waipa is an outgrowth of families in the area, not transplants, families in the area that looked at this piece of land for 50 years and for many of them could not even step foot in the gate. I mean literally put their foot on the pasture land. And when it changed hands, they decided they were going to go after it and they got together on one common goal. We are going to secure Waipa. We are going to return it to Taro lands. We are going to um, share it with the rest of the community. And they got together in that one goal. So I know if, if people in one area realize that there is a piece of ceded land that they have a right to, and they got together in that area and concentrated, and we did this throughout all islands, we would then have a land base. Without a land base, um, you, you wouldn't live in the area and it would be an exodus and that's really happened already to Hawaiian people. Going away helped me realize that the native cry is evident and more evident outside of Hawaii than we were allowed to have happen in Hawaii and that cry is for sovereignty. As part of the project that I'm now working with, we did a survey of the Hawaiians in the area door to door, not through the mail, I actually wanted to see and talk with them and their children. And the basic question, um, the last question that we've asked them is, what is their mana'o on? If they had one wish as a Hawaiian, what would they want to ha have happen to the Hawaiian people? And for some, it takes them a, a whole while. For some, it brings tears. Others readily say, we need a land base. Glenn and I both um, kind of started out in the country and moved back to the city and when we got married and started having children, we thought we wanted our kids to experience that too. We had real nice childhood memories of Molokai. I wanted to take my children to a place where we could raise them and teach them the things we believe in peace and still at some point give something back to the community. This is where we came.
we have high expectations when it comes to education. But then that's still only one part. There's a lot of things that we want them to be able to be independent and get out there and do whatever they want to do, you know, and do things so that they never starve. You know, it's just reinforcing continuously at home, reinforcing, you know, ideals such as taking care of the land, clean, the, you know, be clean. You know, and if you get in the water, the water is it's not an enemy. It feeds you and it becomes, you know, you just got to get them to its natural and becomes instinct. We're here, we're doing what we believe is right. Later on, if the children decide they want to go out there and become professionals, then that's what we'll support. It's up to them, but they're going to have a choice. A lot of kids don't have a choice right now. And um, besides our own children, we sort of uh, informally hanai a lot of children on the island, and they come down and spend time with us. A lot of the kids today, especially alienated students or, you know, kids who is not exposed to environments like this where they have the opportunity to have a choice, they need somebody to work with them to make them understand that, yeah, I do care. Yeah, and you're not a loser, and you're not the bottom of the statistics. And yeah, that we can do something and we can work together. We fish during the winter. During the summer, we run people in and out of the valleys. But that's the kind of work that we do, being in the water. Anything in the water, I enjoy immensely. So as far as what we're doing, we're trying to make a difference. Not so much who we are, we are Hawaiians. You know, we're all Hawaiians and we're all proud of it. And the only way we can be proud and make a difference and be part of the, the overall picture is trying to make a change on a small level. If you swim, you just can drink water right from the top of the water. I'd like to encourage other Hawaiians to just, you know, we're not an example to set up in front of everybody or anybody. But don't give up, you know. There are things that the kupunas have taught us that are true and important. And if we forget them and stop living them, at least in our own yards, then the kids are never going to know about it. You know, they're never going to know that there was something called Hawaiians and they were special. They still are. But we kind of have stopped believing it or... Um, stop believing that we can be Hawaiian and still survive, you know, of course you can. Ho'omau'oi, because I have a dedication, let's continue going out to Kalei and uh, Patty especially. Hapai nuhoi o Patty kei manawa ukahe mai o nu'u, ward mahalo ya oe e nu'u no kaukahe ana mai ia'u. Uh, kau ho ike ana mai, ko kau uh, olalo ana mai, ha pain ho ike ia wahine, ko ko ke hanau ke ia wahine, uh, ke hanau no ike ia wahine, uh, he luu waino ho ikona ino. Ya oi pari, uh, ya oi kalei, ki aloha no. Ua kapa ia ke ia mele o hale akala, uh, e hanau ia nana ho i, ke ia kei ki a o lua, malalo o ke aka o ia kua hivi nani no ho i. No leila mai ia na Brothers Casimero, KML ua kap ia hale akala on KMVI pili ya oi I feel more and more comfortable being bilingual and it's just a wonderful another way to see the world from what I feel is a Hawaiian perspective and that makes me feel good about being Hawaiian I have a radio program, and I'm on Sundays from 11 to 4, and I try to speak Hawaiian, and I play Hawaiian songs so that everyone else can hear the beauty of Hawaiian language, and it isn't a dead language. It's not pau. Olelo wau maka olelo hawaii, e ho ike ya hai, e ho ike ya oe, e ho ike ina po e a pau, i ko aloha no na mea hawaii. 
a ua hiki ia uke hoike he hawa i au ma o ke ia o lalo. No leila, ke o lalo aku wau ma ka o lalo hawa i, ua maupopo noho i au ia uiho he hawa i au. Uh, growing up, we didn't speak Hawaiian in the home. Uh, I, I, wasn't, I didn't think of anything other than having Hawaiian blood. I've always known I had Hawaiian blood. Uh, but when we were growing up, we were just local kids, in the, growing up in Lahaina, where I was born and raised. But uh, there was no Hawaiian language until I was about 20 years old, and taking at the University of Hawaii, and um, a woman who taught me. She was my great-great-grandmother's goddaughter. I'm always grateful to her. Ina manawa apau, mahalo aku wau i kupo e kupuna. I ko lakou o pai pai ana mai ia. I ko lakou kako o mai ia. Ano leila aale wau e ni nau nei he eha paha kei ia. Na ole. Ko u o koa, ko u eha o koa, o e no ko u hele hele na. Ke iki mai oi i au, he haole noho i ke ia. A ali hiki au ke aloa e. No leila, ke noo noo wau e ke epili ana i ka poe Hawaii, me ka ili maku e, a ko lako nana ana mai i au, me ka noo noo ana. Oh, a ole oi a he Hawaii, he eha no ke la. A ka, a ole wau nana i ke la. A ole hiki ia uke nana i ke lā noko mea, he mea ia hiki ole ia uke aloa e. No leila ho mau au me kuu aloha, me kuu mahalo i ka poe e nana ole nei ia u i kuu ili e na e i kuu na au, i kuu puu wai, i kuu ike. Noko mea He hawa i au me ka haa haa. Mahalo aku au i ko upo e kupuna. Ke mālama nei lāku ia. It's Uilani's birthday today. Uilani, hau uli lāha nau ia oe. This is coming from your children, James, April, and Debbie. A very nice slack key number. It's called Opihi Moe Moe. Definitely a classic. For you, on the station that's close to you. KMVI. In Hawaiian, it is a different feeling. The feeling that's there in Hawaiian comes from deep within. It's less cerebral and it's more intuitive, I think. You are exposed to the values. When you learn Hawaiian, you don't not learn Hawaiian values of aloha and lokahi and everything that comes along with it. Once you get those and you use them in your vernacular, then they become a part of you. And you love differently. You have... Um, less conditions on your love. So as I've learned Hawaiian, I reflected on the beauty that's around me because that's what the Hawaiian language does. Hi, welcome to Honolulu. I'm standing here on one of the main water holes, yeah, in this urban trail. And if you come with me, I'll take you on a modern Hawaiian trail now throughout Honolulu, the urban island. Come on, let's go. Bye, 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 Pua Lane. I grew up in these streets. I've seen it changed over the past 20 years. And I still roam the streets. This is where I get ideas. It's a great place to focus. And it's a certain energy that I get when I walk these streets. I guess growing up as a child and uh, just experiencing so many things here. It gives me the idea to write some of the songs that I do. This is the modern Hawaiian Islands. This is modern man continuing to build better trails for better access for modern people on a modern island. Here we have a leak in the growth 
of Island Society. This is it. This is where I grew up. Urban Island. So yes, I'm a musician. I'm a player. The music is the message, the beat. Yeah, the feeling. It's the feeling that helps you get the meaning across. And I guess that's what Brother Nolan music is all about. Definitely music in general as an identity yeah, or as an art form is very much culture. I mean that's your roots. And you take, take what you grow up on yeah, and maybe you try and further it a little bit more yeah, into something bigger and brighter that more people uh, can appreciate or can be inspired and can be stimulated by. I definitely see future in all of our youth music as a as a tool for uh, Hawaii's culture to be uh, expanded into the other parts of the world, so they can better understand what we are really about here in the island. Uh, just like how uh, ja Jamaica and the music, you know, the reggae music has been able to. Uh, hit other parts of the world already and people understand if they don't understand the culture so much they understand the beat and the rhythm and the soul yeah, of it and, and, and you just know that it's true yeah. and it's, it's not so plastic and cosmetic and uh, me as a musician that's, and a player and an artist that's what I try to do it's so polite so I am Makainam. I am not of the ruling class. I am not of the sacred class. I am of the working class. I personally come from Fort Street. Everything I learned about my early understanding of what a Hawaiian was come from inner city. Smoky time, I used to make rice, bag kimonos, and go board dance. We Hawaiians had no rituals. There were no special times of the year when people said, ah, these are Hawaiians. So the, the, there was really nothing, you know. I, I'll tell you what we practiced. We practiced sharing. We practiced giving. And it's really terrible when such a wonderful word becomes a cliche. But we practiced aloha. Now, these are genuine things. The way my children are being raised Hawaiian, uh, again, not being from the ali'i or from the kahuna classes, uh, I don't have rituals to give them. What I have to give them is what Mamara gave me and what I finally learned to be the important things. And that is giving is good. 
To be generous is, in fact, the right thing to do. I sculpt. I paint. I like working with unusual media. I like working with Hawaiian media. I am very land-oriented. I'm also very political. That has been a predominant theme throughout my work for the last 10 years. As a Hawaiian with a conscience and as an artist, I feel that there are things that we must do. I think the attitudes have got to change. I think we've got to really start to think island. I think it's a way of thinking. I think it's uh, a way of dealing with problems. It's a, it's a way you approach things. Island thinking for me in a nutshell is you use what you have to maintain your situation and maintain that situation for generations to come. I think what we wish to leave with our children is the mental psyche so that an understanding of existence in a thing like an island becomes paramount in their existence and not this particular island. Uh, I think we Hawaiians in a particular have been bred away from island thinking. I think we have been, by virtue of that, we have been bred away from the methods that we have devised to survive. And I think that's the cry of my people in the inner cities. That's the cry of my people in the joint on welfare. That we gotta survive, man. Our race is a noble race, and it needs to survive. As with many people my generation, and by my generation I'm referring to to the generation that was born right after the Second World War. And I, I, I have a strong sense that it's, it's my generation, meaning our generation's time to have an effect on the way we live here in Hawaii. I'm looking all the time for ways in which we're going to be able to um, make more room and make more ground for our concerns as Native Hawaiians. And since I'm living on Maui, um, one of the things that I've, I've begun to do is to be very involved in how the county makes decisions on issues that relate to Native Hawaiian issues. Of course, the, the beacon has been Kaho'olawe and the struggle to, to uh, get Kaho'olawe back from the Navy and to stop the bombing there. For many of us, even those of us who were not directly involved in that particular struggle, that's, that's a, that broke ground for all of us. And I think that what, what the Kaho'olawe issue did was it um, reasserted in the public consciousness this claim that Native Hawaiians had to specific rights and, and also made clear once again the Native Hawaiian connection to the land and to the things of the land and the sea. And so out of that politics of confrontation now, I think I see a, a further development, one which involves more leadership on the part of Native Hawaiian groups and Native Hawaiian people. We recently resolved a three-year um, legal battle with Cebu, Hawaii. And we feel that we, we got a great deal out of it because what we managed to do was not only gain uh, recognition of the historical and cultural importance of McKenna County O'Eal Road, but we in fact were able to protect a good portion of that road as it runs through the McKenna Resort for public vehicular use. And we got Kuleana access rights recognized by the McKenna Resort. And we also got uh, public land at one end of the beach in front of the Cebu Hotel for, for a public park. And we got um, close to a half a million dollars for a nonprofit corporation whose sole purpose will be to benefit Native Hawaiians. So I think that we've done a great deal through that resolution process. 
for people who say that you know Hawaiians should just get on with the business of being here now, um, for instance, non-Hawaiians who say that you know Hawaiians should stop griping about the past and get on with with the business of living today. Um, I have to laugh at that. I mean, I, I used to get angry at it. I, I don't think I get angry so much as it any, at, at that point of view anymore as, as I laugh with a certain amount of tolerance and realize that I, you know, there's a lot of education that has to go on in order to uh, let people know that that notion is, is really a history begins with me now notion. And, and it's revisionist. You know, it's, it's, it's like saying that what happened to the American Indians that's all in the past and we don't have to be responsible. In fact, every single one of us is responsible for this, Hawaiian as well as non-Hawaiian. And that the solution finally is only going to come because everyone is going to accept the responsibility for what's happened. You know, and I think that's one of the things that Hawaiians are saying. You know, we're not trying to wrest something away from someone. This is, these are claims that are alive here and now and that will never resolve. And you can't resolve them simply by ignoring them. In fact, that's, that must be abundantly clear to everyone. The fact that because these things haven't been resolved over the last 200 years, that's why they're still here. When I look out and I see what the beauty is here and I realize that what I'm looking at is really a part of me, that it gives me a strong sense of responsibility to take care of the things that I see around me and the things that I feel around me because it's not just the looking, yeah, it involves all of the senses. Often issues get, uh, the rhetoric is set before one even enters into the fray, you know, so it becomes, you know, you become anti-development or you're pro-development. But, uh, you know, it, it goes much deeper than that. I think for many of us who are involved in, in development and land use issues, it goes down to the actual place itself and our sense of um, the spirituality of Hawaii, you know, and what makes Hawaii what it is today, you know, and, and unless we're really in touch with that spiritual core, um, Hawaii will cease to be Hawaii in the same way that Hawaiians will cease to be Hawaiians. And so, in a sense, you could say we're working against that ever happening. And I think that we'll be able to do it. I think we'll be able to keep Hawaii Hawaii for, for everyone. Every day, me and Tara, we will watch it dance across the land. From the mountain slopes, it glided to the corner coast, and led up in Waimea. To me, a big part of being Hawaiian and maintaining your na'au, the rock and the source of Hawaii is to be living in Hawaii. No place else in the whole world is like this. It's a psychic, spiritual difference. This, Hawaiians, to maintain the, what is the essence of Hawaii? You have to be here to hear that song. The, the poetic sense, the, the light afternoon wind to the hapu ferns have a different chord. The, the turtles at Punalu'u Beach, they flap their legs a different way. In Hawaii, you become more graceful when you hear the, all those rough New York chrome angles turn soft. I love it. It's true. <laughs> yes, Father, I saw the Pueblo. It reminded me of how it must have been so long ago. Tara peeled me up and said, where did it go? It went home. Please sing for
Hawaiian Soul was made possible by Central Pacific Bank, the art of service. Fuji Photofilm, imaging and information. Aloha Airlines, let us show you how to fly. Tropical Rental Car, Hawaii's favorite car rental. And Alpha Media Corporation, professional broadcast production. <laughs>